Hi, I'm Rudy Kelly, the subject and co-creator of the new CBC podcast, The Herb Original. Today, we're going to be hearing the incredible story of survival of my lifelong friends, Leonard and Mona Alexey, who've been married for over 70 years after meeting in the infamous Miller Bay Hospital. They now reside in their home village in Black Valence. So as a child, I grew up uh, in a uh, camp setting like uh, wilderness with animals and salmon and trapping. That was our lifestyle in those days for survival. And uh, we would come here in the wintertime, spend a few months in Loch Olams, and uh, Shirley was the first one. Your mom was a good friend of ours. And to me and my cousins, uh, it was a lovely life. It was freedom. And then for some reason, my Aunt Peggy was in Port Edward. And, uh, they had work going there. So my parents, took us over to visit, and I often wonder why, but they didn't return to Loch Alamos. They just got employment in Port Head. It was a beautiful community, because from all over the districts, all over the areas, up and down the coast, it seemed like they all come to Port Head for employment. And there's one, uh, happy community. Everybody knew everybody, although you're from different uh, communities. It was just a friendly place. It was so good. And this was right after the war. Well, what was your first reaction, if you could tell us about that, when you went and saw a cannery for the first time? <laughs> for myself? because of the way I grew up. I was uh, more or less out, out there in the wilderness with the animals and everything. To work in the cannery, it was so amazing. It was so loud. And the different smell there, and not fresh air like, like I grew up. <laughs> it was like a circus. <laughs> It was just music, the cans coming, the music, and the, the motors going. Uh, the living conditions there, I, you know, certainly when Irwin took me out for a tour, because Irwin was the one who really remembered Port Ed a lot, and uh, he told me about how they lived on a dock in a, in a small yeah. shack that all of them had to sleep yeah. in, and they had to go out to get water, a bucket of water and that. Could you tell me about your experience? Was it similar to that? Well, we, where we lived, my mom and dad, my sister Betty, my brother Herbie, and myself, there's five of us. They had just little rooms, uh, a one bedroom shack, I guess you'd call <laughs> Canary Row House. It was very crowded. It was very cold over the water. It was very damp. Um, and our facilities were outdoors. And that's cool. <laughs> Canary Row was meant just for summertime. But there's employment sometimes during the winter. It was not built for that. And it's awfully cool. I know Leonard's worked there a few winters. It was very hard for our native people. I find it hard because it was, uh, there was a lot of discrimination even that late in my lifetime, which was more in my parents' time. Now you got sick too, right, when you were yeah, I got Working sick in Port Ed. Tell uh, us about that, about, about how you got sick. And, and this was about the time when there was so much tuberculosis uh, breakout. 
and I, I ended up in Miller Bay Hospital. They didn't give me much hope. I was there for three years, and each year when you get a treatment, it would last a year. It was uh, experimental treatments for Native people, but I find that the treatments there are very harsh. I know I used to cry every week when I get the, that's when they collapse your lung and they put a needle in your tummy without freezing. Did they tell and you why they, they, had, they, they collapsed you? They pumped the yeah. air in there. The needles were not fine. They had the air oxygen had to go through the, which is not, other people don't suffer as much as I did, but uh, there was some something in there that stopped a needle and they did ram it in there. And that's why I used to cry. She had a hole in her lung the size of a 50 cent piece. That's why they had to collapse it to rest her lungs. Um, she couldn't do anything. She couldn't comb her hair. Uh, yeah, that's the first piece. year. Nothing. First year, you just lay flat on your back. Couldn't comb your hair, couldn't wash your face. Everybody has to do it for you. To show you're still and your lungs are not exerting itself. And then the second year, I got injection twice a day for a whole year. And we're rear end. It got to the point where I couldn't walk very much. The third year, I figured I was going home. The second year, but the third year they came back for the same treatment, twice a day. And this time I really cried because that hurts. Eh? And then all of a sudden. So what's, that guy shows up at some point? That's where I met this guy. <laughs> <laughs> they had a visiting, the patient's visit, uh, just on Christmas. Oh, okay. So I met, I met him for five minutes. Then he went to, they sent him to residential school the next day. To him, that was the beginning. To me, that was the end. <laughs> What was your first impression of Leonard? I didn't know <laughs> I didn't know him. I know he was from Loch Alliance, but I never met him. I knew him as a child, but then we, we went different ways. Leonard's uh, mother had passed away giving birth to him, so he ended up moving in with his aunt who lived in King Colas uh, in the Nass. Yeah. Uh, so he lived in Kinkolas for seven years, and he only knew how to speak Nishka. And then uh, his aunt's husband had passed away, and they had to move back from Kinkola to Lakhvalams. So then um, he had a harsh life here in Lakhvalams for the next three years, and then he ran away to Port Edward to be with his brother and his father. He found out his father was alive, so he moved in with them in Port Edward. And then uh, him and his brother heard there was a new thing out called Family Allowance, and so they wanted to get their share because it was meant for kids. <laughs> and uh, they both, uh, Uncle Johnny and Leonard, uh, both walked from Port Edward to Prince Rupert to the government office to collect their money. And that's where the Indian agent found out. And that's when they sent him to Port Alberni at the age of 10, nine or 10. And he stayed there for the next uh, seven years. While he was in Port Alberni, his father had died of TB. So he became an orphan then. So they kept him there. They didn't send him home. Oh, that's why the seven years. Yeah, and he did, they did finally send him to Miller Bay because he contacted TB in, in Port Alberni Residential School. So they sent him back to Miller Bay, and that's where 
he first saw my mother. And if you remember, my mother was lying in bed for a whole year. She couldn't move. She couldn't do anything. Uh, and so my mother was trying to discourage my father. Find somebody else. What did you say? Oh, how were you trying to discourage him? Well, he was in Alberni at this time. And he wrote letters. And you couldn't see, he couldn't read these letters. <laughs> but I, it took me a while to read it. And uh, that's after he uh, came back from school. I was still in a hospital. I still had, I didn't know how long I'd be there. That I don't know if I'll ever get home. I had no idea if I would. So three years, nah, go on, go. <laughs> but he didn't listen. <laughs> In the meantime, I got to like him. <laughs> he was very friendly and he was uh, easy, happy-go-lucky guy. <clears throat> but I didn't have my hopes up to high because, like I said, I didn't know if I was ever coming home. So I was there three years and I did come home and from the hospital. Then I have a, a whole year of transition. But then we got married in 52. And uh, Seven years we, after the we had, Second World War ended. <laughs> <laughs> we had uh, my eldest son, Art, that same year. And like he said, we were, we wanted more, a bigger family. But it took five years before Peter came along, and that was it. So, through the years, uh, it was okay. And 20 years into our marriage is when I found out about Leonard's experience at the residential school. He didn't mention anything. It was like a puzzle that was some parts missing in his life. So when he stood up in Civic Center at a conference, he told his story. That's the first time I heard it. I wish. I was in Miller Bay first, and then uh, I stayed at Miller Bay. Then they sent me down to Alberni. I liked Alberni. It was a beautiful place, it's a nice lake, but there was a lot of pedophiles in our school. For the f second week, I was there, and uh, one of these guys came in, take the kids who was laying next to me, next bed. Then <coughs> they came back crying. I didn't know why, but I soon find out. A lot of pedophiles in that school. I sat there like different colors of rainbow. My emotions, I was crying so hard for this little boy that went through all that experience. This is when we found out, and then I had Art and Peter come together, and we we talked to him. I told the children not everything, but uh, that he needed our help, that we have to help him. And he went in a deep spin after that, uh, after opening up. His life just went out. Just so much hurt in him. Uh, 
it wasn't until my mother and I had gone to church every Sunday and he drops us off and he wouldn't come in. He had this thing against the churches. But he dropped us off. Then finally he came. And then his life sort of changed after that. Uh, up until that point in his life, in a better part of my life, he really struggled with with uh, the after effects of residential school. He, he became an alcoholic. Uh, he became a, a deep alcoholic, would hide his drinks everywhere, would self-medicate on, on his own. And for the longest time, we didn't understand why he was going through all this all the time. And, and it wasn't until when he stood up in the civic center and talked about his experience in residential school that we finally understand. Uh, I can attest that uh, it just doesn't stop with dad, it runs in the family, intergenerational. So our whole family, because of the residential school, really struggled to keep together. And it wasn't, it was because of mom that helped, helped us keep together. Um, and when he turned his life around, uh, he was a very, very good, good person. He was a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde kind of drinker because of residential school. He'd be very sweet as a dad one day and the next moment he could be somebody totally different because he was fighting those demons inside. Oh. Down, uh, where was this lady telling his story, her story? In the Civic Center. Oh, so, yeah, Civic Center. Hey, I said to myself, she's telling my story at residences of all the pedophiles. It was just <sighs> but with God's help, like we're a very religious family, my wife and I. You know at the time he opened up at the Civic Center? There was no counselors at that time, not one. He broke down and the others broke down. So I also had to learn how to handle this. It was very difficult. So we really struggled because we had no counseling. And he did end up uh, taking the church and Canada to court. There was about eight of them all together, and they won. Because of his testimony and those of the, the, the small group of men that, that came forward for everybody, you know, and, uh, he endured, again, their uh, endless questions. There were, there were many lawyers on their side and only one on that side. He was the one that changed everything. He was the one that got Prime Minister Stephen Harper to stand up in Parliament. It was him and that other group that came forward at the very beginning. Um, so what, what he got out of all that, there's just nothing. It was just peanuts to them. But it did change the whole system, the school system, the judicial system. And that's not the first change that Dad brought around, brought into, into Canada. He was also there for the, uh, to help put together the first all-native basketball tournament. It's going on for 70 years now, or 60. No, it's, it was in 1960, so 63 years old now. 63. He was also there for part, uh, 
uh, responsible for the first uh, friendship center in Canada, which was now Canada-wide. And he was the one that paid the city one dollar to buy a piece of land to start uh, uh, to buy a building to start the friendship center in Canada. Now you guys have lived in Rupert probably for longer than anywhere else, I imagine. Yeah, but, and fifty-seven. You, but, you were about a month old. Yeah. Fifty-seven up to eight years ago. Ten years ago. And then you guys went down to Richmond for a while? Seven And now years. here you are. Complete in circle. Lamps, complete circle. Talk about that, well, your, 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 your journey making it back to Lamps and, and how you feel being back in Lamps. Well, for both of them to decide to come home, I had a lot of thoughts about that. But I'm slowly getting to know what's going on here, and I, I really like it. I love the pool. We go every day, and I do a lot of uh, craft work with the clinic. I find that without the clinic and the pool staff, there's really not much. But we're at the point now also where we're slowing down, so. So I like it. Okay. Uh, I don't know about these guys. <laughs> and you love the pool, right, Leonard? <laughs> you love the swimming pool. Oh, love it. <laughs> <laughs> and now, how long has it been, then, if we look at that? You just, what, what anniversary? Uh, it would be 71 this July. 71 years. You think it'd go that long, Len? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, the people said uh, you can't marry same tribe. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, love. There's no tribe. <laughs> <laughs>